a slight change in the order of our agenda tonight. We're going to, first of all, have the swearing in of the new members of boards. Um, if the town clerk would please proceed to the front with our new councillors, Joe Groff and Rosemary Lee, followed by the school board members, Elizabeth Curry and George and Winsel. superintendent and I asked Chairman Kotschall if I could have just a moment to thank the town council for a most unexpected but most appreciated present. Um, a lovely chair and I just don't understand how you got one that really fits. <laughs> I didn't realize they came in, this, in the short size but uh, it is lovely and much appreciated and I thank you. And also I wanted to invite you as well as the citizens of well, all of our um, public the school has been the recipient of a grant from the Lark Society this year, which uh, features the Portland String Quartet, a wonderful opportunity, uh, mostly devoted to playing uh, for English classes so that there was a combination of music and literature. Their final event is this Wednesday, um, the 12th, at 7 p.m. at Cape Elizabeth High School Auditorium. And we invite you. It's a free concert, also part of the grant, and we hope that Everybody who enjoys string quartet music, and that's everybody, right, will be there. Thank you. Thank you, Connie. This is Tom Shell, members of the council, Mr. Gavin, town manager. My name is Jimmy Gagan. I'm a semi retired attorney of City of Westbrook. And a uh, fairly well known resident of Higgins Beach, the other side of the Stroke River. I have an, a deep, deep pleasure to give this painting of your famous spirit church to the town. The painting. It's been done by, by my daughter, Jamie Gagan, who was born here in Cape Elizabeth when we were living on the Ocean House Road in an apartment building that was affectionately called the Cabbage House on the old Cabbage Farm. That was back in 1954. She went on from Westbrook High School. I was a journey from the city of Westbrook at the time. 
She went to the University of Vermont Med School and is now in the ER department, emergency medicine department of St. Vincent's Hospital in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And I'm awfully sorry that she couldn't be here tonight to make this presentation herself. We have a warm heart for the Sterling Church over the years. My youngest daughter, Patricia Hayden of Flower Mound, Texas, was married there in 1987. And I'm sure you hopefully will find an appropriate place for the hanging of this painting. It's my pleasure. This is Dr. Shell. Thank you very much. We certainly appreciate her thoughtfulness in donating this painting to the town. This Burling Church is one of our oldest historic structures and has a great deal of sentimental value to us all, and we will find an appropriate place for it. Thank, Thank you very you. much. I'd like to take a moment to, to make a couple of presentations, uh, but first of all, I'd like to recognize some special volunteers who have helped produce our show, our show, <clears throat> our meeting, sometimes a show. Um, <laughs> Um, so I'd like to introduce you to the wizards in the control room who are the ones who um, send our uh, meeting out over the air. Tonight we have Lee Chase and Dan Brakely who are running the control room. If you just come forward so everyone can see you. Um, we also have Eric Messerschmidt and Peter Van Fleet and James Kittredge who have helped throughout the year, and I must say the quality of transmission is far superior this year than we've had in the past, and it's getting better all the time. And thank you very much. Each year we make presentations to the outgoing chairman of uh, various boards and commissions. Um, this year we're presenting one to Tom Emery, who was planning board chairman, not for one year, but for two, 1994 and 1995. The planning board is one of the hardest working volunteer boards that we have in town, and it's sort of the ones that interpret a lot of our ordinances and are responsible for the overall physical appearance of a lot of the subdivision and construction in the town as well as future planning. So, Tommy, if you come forward, please. And thank you very much for all your hard work. Another very hard working board that meets, um, provides services for all ages and all members of the community, the Community Services Program and James Greer and Chairman for 1994 and 1995 as well. Thank you, James. And John Roberts, who's been chairman of the Conservation Commission prior to 1995 and has been a dedicated member of that commission responsible for a lot of the development and labeling of trails that we have and the construction of some of the trails through our green belt that is finally coming, becoming a reality. Uh, better known as Jack, if you'd please come forward and accept the flag. We now move on to citizens' discussion period of items not on the agenda. There being no one who wishes to step forward, we'll go on to presentation of reports and correspondence. Um, Town Clerk Reed, uh, excuse me, Town Clerk <laughs> Debbie Lane. <laughs> Dr. Morris, I know you have something to say later, too. Thank you very much. Just a reminder for um, the voters of Cape Elizabeth, tomorrow is primary day. We all vote at the high school gymnasium from 7 a.m. until 8 p.m. The Republican, Democratic, 
reform and green parties will be participating in the primary tomorrow. Also, if you are an unenrolled voter, there is one bond issue regarding a uh, $4.9 million bond issue for statewide library information system. So if you do not wish to enroll in a political party, you may come and vote on the bond issue itself. If you are a new resident to the community and would like to register to vote, you may do so at the high school gymnasium. Please bring proof of ID and residency, which would be a main driver's license via Cape Elizabeth address. Uh, if you are an unenrolled voter and wish to enroll in one of the four parties that I just mentioned, you may also do that at the high school. Again, we're there from 7 a.m. until 8 p.m. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other reports? Councilor Reed. Uh, Madam Chairman, I would like to report and request from the public that uh, they, uh, if they have not already done so, please consider returning the uh, pool study committee questionnaire that was in the Cape Courier. It is fluorescent in color, and you've probably got it uh, on your coffee table uh, if you haven't sent it back. The ID back on June 15th, we would appreciate hearing from people. We have approximately 200 responses, and we would like to get a very fine cross-section of the people in town. And if you do find that you would like to participate in the survey and cannot find it, uh, please call me at 767-0718, and I'll make sure you have a copy. Thank you very much. Thank you. With um, former Councillor Chapel, would like to make a report? The microphone, I'm sorry. I promised everybody on the council that I would make a report, and I think tonight I've been looking at my answer on here. Most of the time I will see that they get a uh, copy of the board meetings, uh, so they'll have it in their packet. Anything particularly interesting, I will be before you and uh, this coming year and give you a report. I thought you might be interested tonight. You've read some of it in the paper, and uh, they keep us pretty well informed, but. I want you to know what happened at the last board meeting that we had. We had three different options that we had to vote on. It was a pretty split committee on the finance committee. In fact, it was three to three, and that's a pretty good split. And so they took it all before the entire board. First thing we had was Chairman Fauché's uh, budget, and we put that up for discussion to bring these other two points out, which I'll tell you about briefly. His budget was taking the profit, now you notice I said profit, from last year and using that as a contingency fund and paying for the capital improvements out of the balance in the M bond fund. The first option was not to take the profits out and not to use the M bond fund, but to charge the localities for every single nickel of uh, RWS's operation which would have brought you up $11 more a ton, and nobody would have been happy with that. So number th three on the table that night was to take the profit from the operation last year and return that in the form of lower tipping fees to the towns and still using the money left over in the M bond issue to pay for any capital improvements and not worry about any capital improvements that might come unexpectedly until they actually come and then we'll face them and deal with them. That brought the total for Cape Elizabeth down to $98 a ton and uh, you can figure that out very quickly. That's a $21,000 saving from what we had for a budget projection. So uh, council has $21,000 uh, extra to start with for next year. Thank you very much. Thank you. Er any other reports and correspondence? Bill. Yes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, this is just a uh, sort of a notice for the Cape Co uh, on behalf uh, of the Cape Coalition. We're looking at s some uh, uh, possibilities for a, uh, we'll call it a coffee house for lack of a better term, for the youth in our community. But uh, what we really need is uh, some input from the youth in our community. So. For those uh, students who are not studying tonight uh, and you happen to be watching, uh, we would like to hear from you to hear if you want to do it at all. Uh, and this is an, a situation where the, uh, um, the establishment is soliciting your input, your direction. So we would encourage you to call, uh, contact the Cape Coalition. You can con call me at 767-4367 and, uh, and tell us your ideas. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? 
Council McLaughlin. Thank you, Madam Chairman. <coughs> just wanted to report to the Council and the public on three separate items. One was held a few Saturday evenings ago at, in, here in town. It was a recognition night for the members of a volunteer fire department, the volunteer rescue folks, the volunteer fire police, and our volunteer wet team. And a few of the counselors were able to attend that and had a good time. And it was always nice to be able to say those thank yous to those folks who put in so many hours for this community. A week ago yesterday, I was very pleased to represent this council and the town at the dedication of the Zimbrich Collection and the Zimbrich Poetry Room at the Thomas Memorial Library. It was a very nice celebration we had that sunny afternoon, and I encourage all of you to go into the library and acquaint yourselves with that very wonderful corner that we have in there now. Thank you to the generosity of the Zimbrich family and their friends and relatives. And to let the public know that on Tuesday, June 25th, which I believe is two weeks from tomorrow, we are having, the council is hosting the third annual municipal employee picnic starting at 1 o'clock. So that afternoon, the town hall, the library, public works, transfer, transfer station. Closed anyway. It's closed anyway. Those other. Those facilities will be closed to the public while the council gives another thank you to the town employees. And we hope you'll appreciate the fact that it is closed and bear with us for that afternoon. Thank you. <coughs> Councillor Reid. The buildings are only closed beginning at 1 o'clock, though, that day. Yes. Right. Any other reports? I want to um, thank Gil Jordan on behalf of the town for the flower boxes he constructed for the town hall and also the flowers he supplied in those boxes and at the public safety building. Any other places that I might have missed? None that he's told me about. None that he's told you about, <laughs> but we appreciate this contribution he makes every year. And especially Jimmy Murray, who each year organizes our Memorial Day ceremony and our parade, and it's becoming quite an event. And it's so heartwarming to see all the citizens standing on the side waiting to see um, the veterans, all our fire trucks, your elected officials, and have the middle school band accompany us for the ceremony. It's, it's becoming quite a town event. Um, Connie Goldman just a little bit earlier thanked the town council for the town chair she received, received yesterday at her retirement reception which was held in the New Pond Cove Middle School um, Cafetorium. It was really quite an event. Definitely worthy of a lady of her caliber. And next Monday, the Planning Board and Town Council will begin one of their first review meetings of the new Zork Committee report, um, the beginning of, of several meetings. I wanted you all to know about those. Moving on now to the meetings of meeting number 21 of the 95-96 year held May 13th. Any additions or corrections? I'll take a motion for their approval. I'll move they be approved as printed. Second. All those in favor? Maybe a 7 0. And I am going to take just a minute to, to just say a little bit about this past year where I've been chairman. As this year's year closes, I've, I've given much thought about how I'd rate the accomplishments of this year as compared to years past. The uh, contentious beginning has settled. We are now concluding a year in which the process to resolution has been restored. The committee reports on ball fields and bike paths are being submitted tonight for council discussion. If the study process had been followed from the very first, I think there would have been less animosity, um, would, that less animosity would have risen. I'm proud that the matters have been handled in an open study process. Now, not everyone is going to agree with the recommendations, but the debate will continue at the council and public levels with detailed and documented information. Out of all this, we have become aware of the needs for a more comprehensive recreational plan. The two reports being submitted tonight 
and the recommendations of the newly founded pool study committee will be a solid core for future evaluation of those recreational needs. Completion of these reports was one of the town council goals for this year. The other goals have been acted upon. These were better communications with the public through meeting agendas on CETV, council packets available at the Thomas Memorial Library in the town office, and articles in the indispensable Cape Courier. A new budgeting format and program-driven budgets are, are being developed, and a conscientious effort by both the town council and school board to plan for capital expenditures and carefully spending of dollars has brought in a reduction in our tax rate. Awareness of and education about drug use and abuse has been enhanced by the new position of community liaison officer. New communication channels for the community, parents, students, town and school officials are being explored. Better appreciation for volunteer contributions to the town are evolving. Board and commission members were invited to climb the Portland Headlight Tower on May 18th and 19th. 101 adults and 49 children enjoyed the breathtaking experience. And by breathtaking, I mean the views as well as having to climb those 81 stairs. The recognition of long-term and outstanding employees has been long overdue. A recommended list of awards has been written. Do you realize that we have five employees who are completing their 25th year of service to the town? The final recommendation of the Zoning Ordinance Rewrite Committee is being submitted tonight after 20 months of arduous meetings. Also worthy of mention, are the ADA accessibility of the town hall, the resolution of transfer station upgrading and landfill closure issues, and increase in the original programming on CETV, in particular Hank Warren's Cape Conversations and Meet Senator Jane Amaral. My only regret is that the Joni Benoit statue is still overgrown by the Rugosa Roses and not as prominently displayed as her accomplishment deserves. Perhaps I can do something that, about that on the slide in the future. <laughs> I have some very sharp brush <coughs> cutters. So upon reflection, the positive accomplishments have overwhelmed the negative beginning. The tasks are too large to complete in one year, but a sound foundation has been laid. And as I pass the gavel to Janet, I know that under her leadership, the process will continue as one of open discussion and informed debate. And I want to thank you all for your assistance and your support during this year. And on to item number one, which is the election of town council chairman, Councillor McGinty. Madam Chair, I have the privilege to nominate Janet McLaughlin as Council Chairman for 1996-1997. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? The 7-0. Congratulations, Janet. You're welcome. Please Please 
your remarks were much to the point. We won't be redundant this evening. You have positioned this council very well under your chairmanship to take good long-term and short-term action, and that's what I look forward to working with you as. Thank you very much. Okay. We have for you a plaque recognizing your chairmanship, 1995 of town council. Thank you. Congratulations. And we want to say a special thank you for hosting a party this evening for the incoming and outgoing counselors and school board members. This is a personal gift. I know you're going to have a little more time to read. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Job well done. Thank you. Agenda item number two is adoption of the town council rules. You received the rules in the packet and this evening at your place was the final page of those in case those had not been in your packet. I would like a motion on that please. Councilor Reid. Madam Chairman, I move that we accept the rules of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council as written. Thank you. Second, no motion. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? 7-0. Thank you. Trying a new council agenda format this evening. We are going with a consent agenda. Proposal is for items 3 through 15 to be on the consent agenda. Is there any councilor who would like to separate out any of those items for a separate discussion and vote? Okay. I will read the items for us. Item number three, appointment of finance committee chairman. Proposal is for John McGinty to be that in that position. Item number four, appointment of the finance committee would be the appointment of the remaining counselors, Phyllis Cogsall, Janet McLaughlin, William Jordan, Rosemary Reed, William Linnell, and Joe Groff. Item number five, appointments committee chairman. Proposal is for that to be Rosemary Reed. Item number six, other members of the Appointments Committee, Bill Linnell, Joe Groff. Item number seven, Ordinance Committee Chairman, proposal is for William Jordan. <coughs> Item number eight, other members of the Ordinance Committee, John McGinty, Phyllis Cogshaw. Item number nine, representative to the Maine Municipal Association Legislative Policy Committee, proposal is for John McGinty to fill that role. Item number ten, Proposal is for a one-year appointment to the Regional Waste Systems Board of Directors. Proposal is for past counselor Irving Chapel to serve in that position. Item number 11, an alternate to the Regional Waste, Sur Regional Waste Systems. Is that right? <laughs> we get people on the right board here, RWS. Um, proposal is for counselor Bill Jordan to be in that position. Representative from the town to the PACS Policy Committee. Proposal is for Manager Michael McGovern to serve in that position. Appointment to the Council of Government's Executive Committee. Proposed for Councillor Joe Groff to serve in that position. Proposal for two representatives to the Council of Government's General Assembly. Proposed Rosemary Reed and Janet McLaughlin. And item number 15, appointment of one councillor for a three-year term <laughs> to the Thomas Jordan Grant Subcommittee. Proposal is for Councillor Linnell. I'll second. Discussion? No discussion on consent calendar. All those in favor? Opposed? 7-0. Thank you. We have Part B consent calendar. We have two requests from the Papudic Club. One for games of chance on September 21st, 1996. The other is a request to correct their liquor, liquor license to show that the premises include the outside deck area. Is there any desire to separate those out? Councilor Cogsall. Yes, I ask that I be excused from voting on these two items since my husband is a stockholder in the club. I see no problem with that. Okay, so approved. You. Anybody else? Councilor Groff. I, I guess I should recuse myself too since I'm a stockholder in the club. Got to be more careful. <laughs> no problem with that. Anybody else? 
One, <laughs> got it. At least five pounds for his voting. All those in favor? Opposed? Five zero with two abstentions. Thank you. I like this consent calendar. <laughs> We have one public hearing on the agenda tonight. This is concerning proposed group use of Fort Williams Park. Do you have an introduction on this? Jeff Van Fleet. Mr. Van Fleet, Chairman of the Fort Williams Advisory Commission. Thank you very much. Good evening. My name is Jeff Van Fleet, and I am Chairman of the Fort Williams Advisory Commission. Uh, a brief uh, background perhaps would be helpful on this uh, particular item. Uh, the uh, last time a group use policy was drafted and approved, uh, it started back in 1986 and there had been several amendments in the interim. Uh, it was felt, however, that perhaps a little more specificity uh, might be warranted because of the sheer number and sometimes uh, real uh, uh, ingenious uh, uh, requests that we receive for uses of the park. Uh, the process began almost a year ago in the summer with uh, the town's summer intern uh, who worked on a draft of a group use policy. Uh, the commission reviewed that policy in succeeding months. Uh, we felt, however, that it needed a little more work, uh, specifically uh, perhaps keeping a little more to the historical uh, uh, intent uh, uh, of the uses of the park. Uh, the town manager proceeded to uh, revise that draft on several occasions and it all resulted in the, uh, the vote uh, to recommend that uh, new group use policy to the council. Uh, we voted, uh, it was the April 25th uh, Fort Williams Advisory Commission meeting. Uh, the only thing uh, I would like to say at this point, I'd be happy to respond to the council's questions or if anything else comes up during this public hearing, is that uh, we do have now some criteria uh, in a little more uh, definitive fashion that uh, we can all use to uh, look at what should and should not take place uh, uh, in the park. And if you compare this with uh, the prior policy and whose genesis was over 10 years ago, uh, I think that's the, the most salient change. So with that, Madam Chairman, I'm at your disposal. Great. Thank you. I will also mention that the Council discussed this item on its workshop held on May 20th, so we have had discussion on it. Is there anybody else from the public who would like to speak to this? Thank you. I will close the public hearing, but if you will stay there for just a moment, Jeff, and we'll see if any counselors have any questions for you. Council Linnell? Yeah, just give a quick, obviously this is uh, uh, mainly geared to groups that are setting something up in advance. And I was just wondering if you had any thoughts. Uh, if a, if uh, half a dozen people show up or a dozen and they want to play soccer or a frisbee or something what's the uh, is that uh, I don't as I understand it this wouldn't particularly refer that cover that not cover that okay. I mean that that's not an issue that would require uh, town manager approval or Fort Williams Commission approval at that scale thank you any other questions thank you very much you're welcome Councilor McGinty. I move adoption of the uh, group use policy for Fort Williams Park. Second. Motion is second. Is there further council discussion? All those in favor? Those opposed? 7-0. We thank the commission for its work. We now have three major reports that are being presented to the Council. These are outlined by Councilor Cogsall in her comments earlier this evening. Item number 19 is the Zoning Ordinance Revision Committee report. And Councilor Phyllis Cogsall was the is the chairman, I don't want to put that in past tense, of that committee. And she will give us an introduction. Thank you, Thank you Madam Chairman, Mr. McGovern, and other members of the Town Council. It's with pleasure and relief that I present the enclosed draft zoning ordinance 
and recommended zoning maps to the Town Council for consideration. In the summer of 1994, the Town Council appointed the Zoning Ordinance Rewrite Committee, uh, which became known as ZORC, to write a new zoning ordinance that would be user-friendly, internally consistent, and contemporary. The decision to prepare a new zoning ordin ordinance was a product of the Town Council's customer service goal and recognition of that oft-amended zoning ordinance needed a new format. In addition to the general reformatting task, Zork was directed to implement the recommendations of the 1993 Comprehensive Plan. State law requires that a community's zoning regulations must be consistent with a locally adopted Comprehensive Plan. At a workshop on September 26, 1994, the Town Council selected these recommendations, which Zork should include in the provisions of the zoning ordinance. The Zork membership includes, in addition to myself, John McGinty, a counselor and ordinance committee chairman, Irv Chapel on the ordinance committee, Bill Jordan, council ordinance committee, Janet McKay as a representative of the planning board, Judy Dooley as a representative of the Zoning Board, John Green, Conservation Commission representative, Alice Rand, a public representative, and Dirk Dahlbeck, former town councillor and public representative. And I must say, with Janet and Dick, <coughs> Alice and John, our punctuation and spelling is perfect. <laughs> John also had vast knowledge of um, the local area and the Great Pond area, and Dick Dahlbeck pushed us intellectually to make sure that what we were discussing and the conclusions we came to were justifiable, reasonable, and intelligent. We have tonight Judy and Dick with us, uh, and our town planner Maureen O'Mary is here for later information. The staff support was provided by Mark Ariman of Planning Decisions, Evan Rickert, now Director of the Zo State Planning Office, and Maureen O'Meara, our Town Planner. Additional input was provided by Jerry Daigle, our Town Assessor, Ernest McVeigh, our Code Enforcement Officer, Michael Hill, the Town's Attorney, and much of the identification and location of historic structures was done by Connie Murray and Lynn Jones of the Cape Elizabeth Historical Society. I would like to take this opportunity to recognize the tireless dedication and super superlative caliber of the members of the Zork Committee. All the members participated fully in the policy discussions and often tedious review of zoning language. Zork held 32 meetings starting September 94 through May 1996 to discuss policy and review zoning ordinance drafts. In addition, the committee took a four-hour field trip in December 1994 to look at cluster subdivisions and old small lot neighborhoods in Cape Elizabeth and the Portland area to supplement the policy discussion surrounding the RB zone and open space zoning. To supplement the scenic protection policy discussions, the committee also commissioned a study of the economic feasibility of scenic protection through cluster development in the summer of 1995. All Zork meetings were open to the public and detailed minutes of each meeting are on file in the planning office. Following the initial workshop with the Town Council and Planning Board in September 1994, Zork made a status report to the Town Council in January of 1995. A joint workshop was held with the Town Council and Planning Board in September of 1995 to discuss the proposed RB district and open space zoning. Another joint workshop in November 1995 featured the scenic overlay districts and the scenic feasibility study. In advance of an advertised call-in show on cable three, a complete copy of the draft zoning to that date was provided at the end of January 1996. The first complete draft of the zoning ordinance was provided to the Town Council in advance of the May 15, 1996 public forum. In August of 1995, for public information campaign, the Cape Courier began publishing a series of articles, a total of nine, 
describing the new zoning ordinance with emphasis on the policy changes recommended in the comprehensive plan. A public forum was held on January 19, January 17, 1996, featuring the proposed Great Pond Watershed Overlay District. Notice of this forum was mailed to the property owners in and adjacent to the proposed Watershed Overlay District. A call-in show was aired on Public Access Channel on January 31, 1996. A public forum unveiling the draft zoning ordinance as a complete document was held May 15, 1996. For this meeting, a public notice and copy of the applicable zoning text and map was mailed to all the property owners in the proposed RB district, the proposed scenic overlay district, and proposed historic structures. All three public meetings were preceded by comprehensive publicity efforts through the Cape Courier, Portland Press Herald, Public Access Channel billboard, and the sign in front of the public safety building. In addition to outreach to the general public, Zork has sought input from specialized groups. In May 1995, the Fort Williams Advisory Committee was invited to participate in redrafting of the Fort Williams District. The Planning Board provided informational comments on site plan and public access waiver regulations. The Zoning Board provided comments on revisions to the conditional use and nonconformance sections. The Conservation Commission representative coordinated comments between Zork and the Conservation Commission with emphasis on the Great Pond Watershed Overlay District proposals. In, a in addition, comments from three Cape Elizabeth residents who have a working knowledge of ordinance and planning issues has been provided. We also have mailed out letters um, to all the members of the Comprehensive Planning Committee to notify them of the completion of this report. The new zoning ordinance has been drafted with an emphasis on consistency and readability. It incorporates new terms and concepts, implements major land use recommendations in the comprehensive plan. In many cases, revisions to the existing ordinance have been made to reflect current custom and practice. During deliberations, Zork identified related er activities that complement the policies in the proposed zoning ordinance, but which are not appropriately incorporated in a land use ordinance. Zork is therefore making companion recommendations to the zoning ordinance in areas of the Great Pond Watershed Overlay District and the Fort Williams District. The Great Pond non-regulatory recommendations are attached. Regarding the Fort Williams District, Zork is recommending that public comments be obtained regarding the Fort Williams Master Plan and any changes made to it. The Zoning Ordinance Rewrite Committee is pleased to submit the new ordinance for the Town Council and Planning Board consideration and will be available to answer questions as review continues. There is a tentative schedule set up for review by these different boards. The first one is to be held Monday, June 17th. Also included, as I said in the report, is the recommended, recommended non-regulatory um, recommendations and programs for the Great Pond Watershed. We include nine pages of an overview of the final changes that we have made in the zoning ordinance, policy changes, minor changes, uh, deletion of some sections that are no longer applicable. We also have all the public comments and questions that were asked at the May 15th uh, forum and most of our responses considering these comments. And then we get into the RB open space zoning, RA density comparison, because there's been a lot of confusion as to exactly what the calculations um, should be. It's a very long ca calculation process. It's not as simple as taking one requirement out of the whole thing and saying that is what this is. So this gives you some idea of all the calculations someone needs to go through to get to the actual number of lots that are, would be used for building. Plus, um, we have um, very brief plans of the different areas we toured when we were looking at the clustered housing neighborhoods in the greater Portland area, and then on to our multi-page um, Zork recommendations. 
Now, these are recommendations. We had some very heated debates and discussions about these issues, and not every person is for everything that's recommended here. This is a consensus report, and I'm sure that it will continue to be a consensus report with the next boards that will deal with it. Um, did you bring the map? Maureen has, has brought the proposed new zoning map just to have it available. This is the current map as it now exists. This would be the new map that would also need to be adopted with, with whatever final proposals we have to show you some of the changes that we've had. Are there any questions? Rosemary? Um, Phyllis, when will the agenda of the um, June 17th meeting be public? I believe that um, Janet and Maureen and Mark and I are having a meeting tomorrow afternoon <coughs> to try to lay out the procedure will that, that be we will follow. Cablecast on Channel 3? Many people are interested in with, with the numerous meetings, what will be discussed at each specific meeting? Do you mean the agenda? Yes. I don't see why not. You would have to um, ask the chairman. <laughs> the, the intent of the meeting tomorrow is to try to figure out the way the agenda will go forward. However, I think it's understood that beyond that, the committee, uh, the, the two groups at their first meeting will have an opportunity to revisit whatever we come up with tomorrow to uh, really see if that is, is in fact the, the process they want to follow to go through it. And is the expectation that basically all the groups will have been able to review the report and make their preliminary comments on the whole on the 17th? Essentially yes, but those, expe you know, those expectations are uh, the topic of tomorrow's meeting to figure out how to continue to make this process as, as inclusive and as open as possible. Thank you. And Mark Arman also will be guiding us and acting as sort of a facilitator through these discussions since he's extremely knowledgeable. I was highly impressed, not only by his knowledge, but his demeanor, <laughs> considering we have a lot of very strong personalities on that committee, and he just handled us all very well. I also want to let the public know that copies of this draft are available at uh, Thomas Memorial Library and also here in the town hall for anyone in the public who would like to look it over. Any other questions from the council? Any comments from the public? Thank you very much. Thank you. May I just say one more, more little thing? I really want um, to thank publicly the extra effort, continued hours, and um, wholehearted dedication that our planner, Maureen O'Mara, has given to this project. It, in, it, in of itself, is a full-time job, but she in included this with all the work that she does with the planning board, plus answering all the public's questions. She was extremely receptive to anyone and would take the time to sit down to try to explain some of these proposals, and will continue to do so, I know. So, Maureen. I'd like to join with Phyllis as well in uh, praising Maureen for all her extra efforts on this project. You know, I look, I look at that particular zoning ordinance draft and, you know, some could look at it as 130 odd or however many pages there are in it as, uh, you know, a lot of words on a page. But I think when you, when you put all those words together, they really create an image of what this community will look like for many years into the future. And this particular ZORC committee was very oriented at looking at pictures. Uh, in that, that same theme, one of the members really took that to heart and uh, prepared a painting that showed his sense of what the Cape Elizabeth community could look like in a real sense of community. I think everyone knows that that individual is E. Irving Chapel, uh, the, the most recent past member of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. Well, anyway, Herb did a painting, and Phyllis and Bruce Cogsell were nice enough to have the full committee to dinner a week or so ago, and the committee members all uh, got T-shirts that had a picture of the painting on the cover, and everyone loved the painting, 
And uh, I don't think anyone loved the painting more than Maureen O'Meara. And uh, in recognition of all of her hard extra work on this, on behalf of the committee, on behalf of Phyllis, the town council, and myself, I'd like to present you this E. Irving Chapel original. Oh. Councilor Coxell. Madam Chairman, I move um, that we acknowledge receipt of the draft of the Zork Committee report along with the accompanying maps. Second. I'll entertain that motion if you say we'll receive it with gratitude. <laughs> I'll, I'll let you amend it, so. Thank you. I'll go along with that. Thank you very much. Any discussion from the Council? Councilor McGinty. Um, Madam Chair, I would encourage the public to, to stay in touch with this process. It's far from over, and certainly a lot of issues were raised at the uh, May 15th uh, hearing, and I think there's a long way to go with this, so again, I encourage the public to, uh, to follow along with the process and continue to provide us with input. Thank you very much. Just a note, further note to the public that the continuing workshops reviewing this draft are certainly open to the public. We will do our very best to get even next week's agenda for that review onto the cable so you'll know what exactly we are going to be discussing. That said, all those in favor of the motion? Opposed? Seven to zero. Thank you very, very much, all of you in the audience and who are not here this evening who worked on this. Item number 20 is another culmination, a major effort in the town, again representing some planning, good planning work that's gone on. This is the report from the Pedals and Pedestrians Committee. I believe we have one of those co-chairs here this evening with us to give us some information. Mr. Bayras. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the Council. It sounds like that Zork Committee is kind of fun. <laughs> T-shirts, all those sort of things. All we had were black fly bites. <laughs> um, <laughs> the committee was chosen a year or so ago. We've met over 20 times in two, two hour sessions, generally on Wednesday evening. And we've met uh, two or three long bus trips on Saturdays with the uh, Land Commission and the uh, Land Trust Group and also the uh, Conservation Commission trips. And we've walked over uh, all of the green belts, uh, looked at all the sites, uh, and have learned an awful lot about Cape Elizabeth in the process. Our committee was made up of a, quite an astute group, starting off with the two councillors which were on the committee, Rosemary and E. Irving Chapel. And then uh, I was very pleased to see that the town council had chosen a good representative, uh, representatives from the other committees. We had uh, the Conservation Commission, uh, Bob Harrison, who isn't here tonight. Several committee members are here this evening, and they are, will answer any questions for you if, if you want to go directly to them. Uh, we had uh, Gary Beckwith, uh, which is a very well-known bicyclist. You see him all over town. and. And uh, he's also involved with several of the other boards in the uh, area. We were assisted by uh, Steve Simons, who's here this evening. Uh, certainly a long, long and a tooth member of the association here of Cape Elizabeth. Mark Toothaker, who happens to live on Two Lights Road, one of our local lobster fishermen. Steve Etzel from the planning board, which is a great help. Thank God you put him on there, because several times he pulled us back and got us in the right direction. Bob Schumann, who did do the chair of the final uh, survey that was done, was quite successful. I'll refer to that later. And uh, Sarah, of course, I guess I've touched everybody. Yep. John Hare, Miss John. And uh, John's a local fellow with a lot of contractor experience, travels all over the state, and had quite a bit to add to the committee. Sarah, of course, uh, isn't here this evening. She's in Omaha, of all places. 
and she's a little spark plug that's kept us going. Uh, and a very active person. I'm very pleased to have worked with her. And I was very surprised to find all the things that she's capable of getting done. We have, were helped by a fellow named Bob Fonts that you folks selected as a, a consultant from uh, Lewiston, Auburn area. Uh, worked very hard uh, with us, and I was very pleased with his input. We had a firm from Burlington that did the uh, engineering work uh, that were quite experienced in bikeways, gave us a lot of information that we didn't know, and helped us quite a bit coming to a decision. We also used a firm called Eaton Engineering, I believe it is, for some of the traffic work that was done. We were uh, astounded with the original charge they gave us, which was about two pages of single spacing that seemed to me to be more of a, I don't know, a Magna Carta manual or something, but it was much bigger than we thought we were getting involved in originally with just bikeways. It turned out that they wanted us to review like 50 years in the future, what's going to happen to all the things in town, seemed like. It was pretty stopped us in our tracks to start with. Uh, when we read the public participation part of it, we really worked hard on that. They asked us to provide for exhaustive public interaction and to prepare a strategy for meaningful public participation and input at every stage. We certainly tried that. We were in a courier, we announced our meetings, we had a couple of uh, big meetings that were scheduled with uh, very little turnout, uh, which surprised the Dickens. Uh, we had a lot of conversation about things in this committee, but we did not get the kind of public attendance at some of our hearings that we thought we would get based upon the contentious uh, original meetings that you did have there. We. Uh, met with uh, Jack Malley, uh, Bob Malley and uh, Jack Roberts uh, and Gary Beckwith in our first meeting to try to explain to us all the background information so we could start to move forward. It soon became apparent that we needed to uh, come up with some criteria for evaluating bikeways and roadways and, and we started to work on that right away. We uh, visited every road in the town that we prioritized as far as being something that should be looked at for a bikeway. Uh, Gary Beckwith took pictures of all of the roads and towns and put them on slides that we were able to compare uh, one to the other the evenings that we made the evaluations. I'm not going to go into all of the uh, criteria that we used to come up with the uh, various ratings, but they're in the report. The early in the discussions, we decided we'd better get a complete, comprehensive survey of what people really thought. We all felt it was about a 50-50 split in the town, but we wanted to get it down paper. So uh, Bob Schumann and, and his two or three committee fellows put together a survey. We ran it out as a uh, sample and then came back with it. And we were very pleased. We had over 800 replies. and they knocked us over really with some of the answers because they came back with many, many written comments. They, um, I'm going to refer to the survey right now because you have copies of it. It's an appendix to the report. But for the people that have not read the survey, there were just two or three percentages that I felt kind of outlined how the town feels. The survey was done for both bicycles, green belts, and pedestrians. But uh, on the bicycling, uh, there are now enough places in Cape Elizabeth to meet your biking recreational needs. 55% said yes. 45% said no. Uh, are there enough places in Cape Elizabeth to meet your hiking, travel, commuting needs? It was even stronger. 76% said yes. 24% said no. That seems to be pretty strong. But when you get over into the next section, we ask them, do you think that Cape Elizabeth streets and roads are currently sufficient to handle existing walkers, runners, and cyclists? Yes, 39%. No, 61%. So we flip right over again as we go to that general question, because that refers to, to uh, sidewalks, green belts, all ways of, of getting around the town. I thought those two comments were particularly interesting 
The third thing I wanted to comment on was the fact that in every section here, both bikes and uh, walkways, pedestrian ways, um, a significant percentage of our answers came in that they would prefer to have their taxes increased. 37% uh, under 50 bucks a year, 12% over 50 bucks a year, which is basically 50%. So one of the things that we're going to suggest to you that's not in the written recommendations is that the council consider a possible checkoff system on our tax system where people that want to contribute to a fund that would start to put some beans in the jar for bikeways, for green belts, or for walkways, they could do it like the federal boys do, just have a checklist there and give their $50 and over time might add up to something significant. On the uh, survey, we don't want to get into it tonight in, by page, but are there any questions about the survey while well, Bob is here? Uh, you have, folks have had a chance to look at it. Anything else that comes up? At, apparently not. We're going to jump right then to the uh, recommendations. We have a few small changes in your report on page 6-1. The uh, first major vote was the committee vote on the acceptance or rejection of the ice tea grant to build a bikeway on Shore Road, ASH 2 specifications. And that's important, to ASH 2 specifications. The motion was made by Sarah and seconded by Rosemary. The vote was five to six, not in favor. And we have to put the word not in favor there. It was a misprint. <clears throat> On page 6-4, we had originally put those last two paragraphs in as recommendations to the council. But then, in the wisdom of some of the senior members, they suggested that we should delete those as recommendations and just let them ride as uh, suggestions. So if you just put a circle around those last two paragraphs and uh, put, say that these are suggestions from the council, from the committee, but not recommendations. The uh, second major vote was the vote to accept or reject the Department of Transportation ICT grant to build a bikeway on Two Lights Road to Ash Two specifications, ending at the entrance to Two Lights State Park. The motion was made by Sarah, seconded by Rosemary, and the vote was eight to three in favor of building that road, that bikeway. As we go on from there, our next major recommendation as soon as possible, because we realize the funds may not be available immediately, the town of Cape Elizabeth should build a multi-use trail on the Spurwink River route to connect the school complex with Starboard Drive, including a spur from the midsection of the trail over to Longfellow Drive. The Spurwink River multi-use trail should be constructed with a gravel surface initially. It was seconded by Herb motion was made by Sarah and the vote was 9 to 0. So it was a real favorite of us. For the rest of you that are not familiar with it, it's the area behind the school system that runs over to the, the Scott Dyer Road. There is an existing sewer line in there and it's going to be pretty easy to make it into a trail. I'm a little bit uh, not at ease, but I'm, I'm not sure you want me to go through all these things since you have it all in front of you anyway. I think we have them all in front of us, and we certainly are going to be seeing you folks again in workshop. All right. Then that covers most of what I had to say. I wanted to tell you that Sarah, recall, wrote a very nice letter to you, which I think you may have in your position. <coughs> Good. She, uh, I would appreciate it if you would refer to that in the uh, thinking about the committee report. 
Ms. Barris, I would make one request of you. There's reference in Sarah McCall's letter to an assessment that was not part of the report. And if you would please see that all of the counselors receive a copy of that assessment, please. We need to have as full information as was generated for the committee. Yes, I'm not sure whether the counselors have a copy of the original report either, the Berman report on the safety on shore road. I, I think we do, but I would rather have it twice than not have okay, it. Okay, we'll get you copies of both. Well, one contradicts the other somewhat. That's, that's fine, but we need to have everything that was available to the committee. Thank you. I wondered if you had any questions for my counsel, uh, for my uh, committee, or Rosemary. Uh, Bob, I'm sorry, just before you leave, also on your recommendation, page number four, that was also recorded incorrectly. That was a 4-3 not in favor on that same page of the May 22nd um, recommendations of the P2 committee that you were just reading down. Number four. Six one. Uh, four seven. Four seven. Well, I'm not sure we, I'm with you, Rosemary. Okay, four um, seven. I was on six. In, in the appendix under the recommendations. Thank you, Bob. Oh, that's 6-2, yeah. Right, the vote was incorrect, as in the book. It's 7-4 against, not 4-7 in favor. So if we just say not in favor, it would be uh, yep, not, fair correction. Right, just add not there as well. Heaven forbid, I would want to make sure that I didn't let a misconception pass. Mm. We want it to be accurate. Are there any other questions or comments from the counselors? This time, we will be dealing with this in workshop later this summer. Yes, I th I think that uh, you'll see in the report that we have talked a lot about three greenbelt routes: mm -hmm. easterly, central, and westerly. We understand that that they're not immediate routes. And our looking at the Green Belt was quite different than the Green Belt uh, group that looks at it in the conservation. They look at it as a site. We were looking at it as a way of transport for the Green Belt. We do think that over time, which might take as many as 10 years, that that trail system could be developed. And that's what we're trying to say to you in the report. We understand there are some very tough uh, landowner positions that you're going to have to get by. But we do think you should start to have some kind of a way to approach these landowners with a way to get a conservation easement across their land to build the green belts. That's in the recommendations as well. Thank you very much. Thank you for that encouragement. Councilor Cogsell, did you have a question? I just wanted to thank the committee because it was a phenomenal task that we gave you and you worked very hard and we greatly appreciate all the work you've done, and I move that we, uh, the report be received with gratitude for all the efforts of the committee, and the um, report will be referred to a town council workshop. Second. Before that's voted. Certainly, Councilor Reid. Uh, Madam Chairman, I do uh, think that there are other members of the committee who had some comments they'd like to have included uh, for the record, if possible. I think that's appropriate. Is there anybody else from the committee who would like to speak to this item? tonight. We'll I'll be glad to take your comments in um, the workshop setting as well. Councilor Reed, I'll questions? reserve my comments. Mr. McGovern? I just had one explanatory comment. Th this particular report uh, was in large part funded uh, through a, a grant from PACS, the, the Regional Transportation Planning Agency. Because of that, we, we were able to have 200 copies of it printed. Uh, so anyone who wants a copy of this report uh, will be able to get one and, and keep it. This Zork report, uh, is, as I mentioned, is a lot more pages, and the policy we're going to be using on this, they're available for inspection, but we, we'd like them to rotate in and out so that you actually sign them out and, and then return them because they, they are so expensive and this is totally locally funded. Uh, not that we spend federal money, but they were willing to print them, so why not? The, as long as I'm speaking about it, the next report 
that you will be hearing about on ball fields is one that, again, we have very limited copies, and we will be circulating those uh, in and out and not providing multiple copies unless people want to specifically pay for the cost of reproduction. Uh, with, with the case of this one and the third one, but not the middle one. Okay, I would just caution that on the Pedals and Pedestrian Committee report that if they're going to be handed out, that the changes that were mentioned tonight be made, if possible, before those that go out to the public, because it, it's quite significant. I noticed a couple of those, and I was reading through it, that the vote seemed a little off. You helped me understand why that was, but there were some very important not words. So those reports will be available on Wednesday. Thank you. Council Cogswell. I just wanted to, to um, bring to everyone's attention that on the, those two committees, the reports from Zork and from the P2 committee involved 21 volunteers and citizens, so that's, that's quite a large number of people. Yes, and they were dedicated because they were there from the beginning to the very end. As Mr. McGovern said, we had um, really dedicated people. Thank you very much. Councilor Reid. May I have the, hear the motion again, please? Um, I move that we um, accept with grati gratitude the P2 committee report and that the port report be referred to Town Council Workshop on a date to be determined. Are we going to be determining that tonight? We may get to that after this meeting tonight. I cannot conceive that that workshop would be in the month of June. Okay, thank you. The, we should have time to let the public know. I just thought that there were members of the committee present mm -hmm. who might want to know if they have to come back in the next couple of weeks. As I said, don't look to June for that one. <laughs> we have a lot of work ahead of us. Any further discussion from the council? Those in favor of the motion? Those opposed? 7-0. Thank you. Item number 21 is a receipt of report of analysis of potential ball field locations. This is a report the council received in its packet. Mr. McGovern has just given us some information on it. This is prepared by OST Associates. I believe we have a representative of that firm here that is being all microphoned in to walk us some rendered drawings on the boards over there. Please introduce yourself. My name is Steve Harding. I work for OS Associates. Uh, we're out of South Portland. We've been hired by the town to uh, investigate uh, some various alternatives for youth uh, recreational fields at uh, Lions Field and at Fort Williams Park. Uh, the fields that we looked at were a Little League baseball field and a combination soccer lacrosse field. Uh, the primary focus of our study was to develop costs for, uh, on an engineering uh, standpoint, for the various alternatives that we looked at. We've developed three alternatives for the Lions Field uh, site. These are the, the three to my uh, immediately located. Uh, and then five other alternatives for the Fort Williams Park site. Um, we were asked to use readily available data that was uh, existing. So uh, existing topography, uh, property lines, uh, wetlands information, and some subsurface conditions uh, were taken from studies that have been done previously or for projects that were done in the vicinity of the uh, sites. Uh, for in, in order to uh, develop design parameters, uh, we referenced the Little League official regulations and playing rules handbook, and we also use the uh, American Institute of Architects uh, architectural design standards. Basically, for a Little League baseball field, the preferred alignment from home field to second base is in an easterly to a northeasterly direction. Uh, the slope of the uh, infield can uh, go as high as 2% uh, across the diamond from first to third or from third to first. Uh, the outfield could, can be graded to uh, a maximum of 2.5%. Given the topography of the sites, uh, we, we did use uh, the maximums wherever possible. For the soccer lacrosse field, it really isn't the preferred or orientation of the field. Uh, the longitudinal center line should be flat with a crown uh, promoted along the sides, to the sides of the field. Uh, the preferred crown is a 1% slope. We used a maximum of 1.5% in most cases. Um, for the Lions Field, 
site. Uh, basically, there's an existing Little League baseball field uh, uh, located off an access drive to the, to, the, uh, to the site. There's a small pond which is located to the east of the existing field, uh, which is used for skating in the winter. Uh, alongside Ocean House Road, there is uh, uh, residential house lots. You have the Wildwood condominiums to the north of the site. Along the east of the site, there are three residential house lots, which are currently undeveloped. And further to the south is a, a large expanse of wetland area. Um, the focus of our study was in the undeveloped area to the north of the access drive. I should note that the access drive is paved to approximately here, which is about 500 feet from uh, Ocean House Road. There's a gravel portion, which is about 200 feet long. And then there's a grass tote road leading to the residential lots uh, to the west. There's a 40-foot right-of-way, which has been established along the center line of that, that grass tote road uh, to serve these uh, residential lots in the future. Our focus was in the area to the north of the access drive and its right-of-way, which is in, encompasses about 13 and a half acres. Uh, the site constraints, which would affect ball field development, most obvious uh, is uh, the slope of the terrain. Uh, ranges from 3 to 13 percent. Given the design criteria, that's, that's a pretty substantial di difference uh, in, in which you must uh, overcome to create these ball fields. Uh, related to the slopes are the ledge at the site. Uh, we did numerous hand probe uh, investigations, and we also had the town uh, backhoe out there digging some test pits. What we found was that the ledge was very shallow in the upper reaches of the field, and uh, reach depths of four feet and beyond near the access road. Unfortunately, the area where we need, would need to do the most cut is in the area of the shallowest ledge. The area where we would do the most fill is in the area where the ledge is at its deepest point. So it didn't work out as well as we had hoped from a construction standpoint. There's also wetlands to contend with at the site, uh, primarily the buffer that we need to put uh, off the wetland areas. The current zoning ordinance requires a 250-foot uh, wetland setback from an RP1 wetland and a 100-foot wetland setback from an RP2 uh, wetland. There are three RP1 wetland zones associated with this. It's the area to the south of the site, a small pocket on the westerly side of the site, and uh, an area that follows the stream, which goes in a southerly direction. There's also an RP2 wetland uh, located to the north. When you look at those and you go to the uh, alternative one, uh, we uh, tried to, originally we tried to, um, we were directed to have, try to fit two little league fields, a soccer cross field, and a parking area at this site. When we established the wetland setbacks, we quickly realized there wasn't any way that we could fit that kind of a development in this kind of an area. So we broke up the overall design scope into these three scenarios and tried to go from there. Um, we also used two wetland buffer setbacks. We used the current zoning ordinance with a 250-foot RP1 wetland, and we also used a 100-foot wetland setback for all the wetlands. Um, and when you try to compare the cost between the three uh, alternatives, I'd, uh, a word of caution is that you have to keep in mind that there are three very different scenarios. So it's very difficult to uh, compare the costs between the, threes with, between the three alternatives without taking that into account. Um, the first alternative, we used a 250-foot wetland setback, um, and we have one Little League baseball field. Uh, the setback uh, severely compromises what you can do in the site. You're pretty much pushed into where you have to put the field and the associated parking area. Uh, this affects the cost, the playing field surface elevation, and the excavation that's required to build it, and the subsequent cost from that. Uh, also, technically, Based on this RP1 set line, setback line, you can't technically have access to the site without um, violating the buffer restriction. Uh, there should be a disclaimer, though, along this, this setback. This was taken from a study that was done for the um, right-of-way alignment work. Uh, the wetlands were delineated in February under a foot of snow cover, so the, the boundary is certainly suspect. If this alternative was uh, selected, probably the first thing you'd want to do is have the wetland study commissioned and go out and accurately uh, locate the wetland. Because of the restrictions and the amount of leads that has to be removed, 
This Little League field uh, is estimated to be about $318,000 to construct. Uh, if we move to the second um, alternative, this features a 100-foot wetland setback. Uh, we have two Little League fields with associated parking. Uh, the orientation of the fields, this, this particular field does not meet the preferred orientation. The one to the right does pretty much line up with the preferred northeast uh, orientation. Um, the area involved, as you can see, there's a lot more area uh, to, to use because of the 100-foot setback. Basically, from a 13.5-acre um, area, we've been reduced to a little less than 3 acres in this scenario. This is about 7.5 acres, so you got almost double the area in which to work with. Um, basically, these, these two fields, as, uh, as designed, would cost a little over $300,000 to, to construct. If you looked at this in a phased approach, and you did just one field at a time, uh, the easterly most field is probably the most practical to build. Uh, it's in a little bit better location for the ledge, and you also get a little break in the topography down here. The one field uh, by itself would probably cost about $165,000 to develop. Um, the third alternative features a soccer lacrosse field and a little league field. This alternative was primarily left in our study for the demonstration purposes. Uh, because of the shape and the size of the lacrosse field, a substantial amount of earthwork is going to be involved uh, in trying to build that on the hillside. We've compromised the grading. We don't have a crowned approach. We've We've gone from the northerly side, a, a straight cross slope to the southerly side. And that still didn't really help us as much as we had hoped in the costs. Uh, and basically, this alternative becomes something like a $600,000 uh, project. And again, the, the reason we left it in the study was for the purposes of uh, just to, to demonstrate what would happen if you had a soccer lacrosse field that you wanted to build here. For the Fort Williams site, we've uh, studied an area that's in the southeast quadrant of Fort Williams. Uh, it's basically a four and a half acre site which is currently covered with brush and then there's a grass field area down here. You have the Fort Williams batteries to the east, a, an existing parking lot to the north which was recently constructed. You've got material stockpiles for the public works here, another equipment storage area using an old uh, uh, buildings uh, foundation and the Delano Park uh, residence area down here. Uh, the site itself still features uh, about 100 or so concrete tent pads in this area. There's also some remnants of uh, old building foundations along Lake Road here. As part of this study, uh, we were asked to um, look at a one little league field with an overlapping soccer lacrosse field. Uh, we were asked to maintain the alignment uh, of the access to Blake Road, either by maintaining the alignment or realigning uh, the road to the west. Um, we've also been asked to maximize the buffer between the plank surfaces and the Dolina Park uh, area to the south. Uh, the site constraints, even though it's not as dramatic as the Lions Field, there's still a, a substantial uh, difference in terrain across the field. It ranges from about 4 to 10 percent and with the steeper slopes being alongside uh, Merriman Road to the east. Uh, the subsurface conditions, according to a previous study, indicate that the site is uh, primarily fill, uh, about four to five feet of rubble in an area on the westerly side, and then very shallow uh, ledge to the east, and then actually the slope, you can see uh, evidence of ledge. Um, for the first alternative, this is basically the same alternative that was uh, studied and promoted by the Fields for Cape Kids uh, last year. Uh, it was included in this study basically for a comparison. Uh, the only things that we have changed, uh, we've added a buffer, a vegetated buffer strip uh, to the southerly side to kind of enhance the, uh, the difference between uh, the playing surfaces and Delano Field. And we've also changed the, the grading of the, the soccer lacrosse field to get a more crowned effect. Uh, the cost to do this would be about $150,000. Uh, alternative two, we've just rotated the soccer lacrosse field about 90 degrees, moved it further to the north to increase the separation between there and Delano Park. Uh, I should note that the Little League orientation for both of these scenarios doesn't match the preferred orientation, which would be in this direction, 
However, it does match the existing Little League field over at, I believe it's pronounced Blasted Park across from Shore Road. Uh, the cost to do this particular scenario would be also be about $150,000. Um, alternative three uh, is basically the same, only we've moved the soccer lacrosse field over about 90 feet to the east and changed the orientation by about 30 degrees for the Little League baseball field. We did this in an attempt to try to take advantage of some of this area over here to the east. Unfortunately, the, this works really well from a plan view perspective, but when we tried to grade it, we ran into some significant problems catching grade on this side. Uh, when you do that, you're limited to the elevation of the playing surface. Because it's staying relatively flat all the way to the west, you get into a significant cut area here. This increases the cost of the project by about $100,000, so this became a, a quarter million dollar um, scenario. The uh, alternative four is basically a mirror image of alternative, alternative two. All we've done is move the Little League baseball field to the west of the soccer lacrosse field. Uh, we did give some consideration to changing the orientation to make it align uh, in, in a more preferred um, pattern. Uh, however, to do that, we would have had to rotate home plate and bring it almost uh, approximately 200 feet to the south. And we felt that would increase the, uh, or decrease the buffer from Delano Park, so we maintained this orientation. And this all, uh, option also is about $150,000. Uh, alternative five is also similar to alternative two, and then we've compressed the two fields together. Uh, we've, we've got a complete overlap of the Little League baseball field onto the playing surface of the soccer lacrosse field, which probably isn't very, uh, isn't a beneficial situation for the soccer lacrosse considerations. This ended up being a little more expensive than the other alternatives at 155000 That's basically an overview of what we've done and I'll try to answer any questions if anybody has any. Thank you, Mr. Hardy. Any questions from counselors? Councilor McGinty. Was there any consideration at looking, combining both locations? In other words, perhaps putting one baseball field at one location and the soccer lacrosse field at the other, or vice versa. You kind of do that with alternative two um, at Lions Field with the baseball field. But was there any consideration of, of just simply putting the soccer lacrosse field at Lions and a baseball diamond at the fort? We didn't or, and did you cost it out? We didn't formally address that in the report, but I can tell you that in looking at alternative three of the, of the uh, Lions Field proposal and the cost that came in, if the needs for both the baseball field and the soccer cross field are relatively even, and that you feel that you need one of each or two baseball fields and a soccer cross field, the Lions Field area isn't the place to put it. Uh, it certainly would have to go at, uh, at Fort Williams if, if these are the only two sites considered. If you just did a soccer lacrosse field at Fort Williams, you could probably take forty to fifty thousand dollars off the cost of, of any of these alternatives that are in the hundred and fifty thousand dollar range. Thank you. Anything else, Mr. McKinty? No, that's fine. Thank you. Councilor Groth? When all the little league fields at Fort Williams, if in fact uh, the earlier recommendations were followed of no fence, no backstop, no dugouts, and no scoreboard, um, that would reduce the cost that you've talked about by another $18,000 or so, is that correct? Yeah, I, I would have to check the numbers, but um, if you look at our cost analysis, you can certainly just line those right out. Who, uh, who instructed you that uh, for Fort Williams, there was supposed to be a fence, backstop, dugout, scoreboard, that level of sophistication uh, in your study? Uh, I guess we took it upon ourselves, and given that uh, it was, a, it was a, a Little League baseball field, we looked at the fields that were uh, developed for the existing field at Lions Field and the one at Playston Field and felt that that was a similar situation and we were going to design to that standard. Certainly, uh, if, if those features or those amenities aren't uh, what the council wishes, you can certainly strike those. Thank you. Councilor Coxell. Yes, it's, n it's now a federal requirement with any kind of construction of a public facility that 
um, ADA accessibility be built into the design? Mm -hmm. Do any of your figures include uh, um, construction amounts for those? We did grade these these plans here. Um, basically, there's there's a, there's a difference between the two in that the Lions Field has um, parking as part of the proposal. The Fort Williams Field was developed with the assumption that this existing parking area would serve as the needs for, for this field. So in developing these scenarios, we did follow the ADA compliance as far as grading. Now where the walkways go, um, you know, that that's, uh, can be a final design consideration. Uh, this particular scenario, we didn't do that. Again, that, that would probably need to uh, uh, come from this area, either be some kind of a, a walkway or a ramp or something from that area. Uh, in answering your question, as far as the cost, no, um, probably something in the magnitude of uh, $5,000, $4,000 would, would certainly cover that. That would be for each? I would think with, much? with each uh, proposal. It would be about 5000 for either, either location? I think that would be a, probably a very comfortable number. Thank you. Councilor Nell. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I was just looking at uh, lines number three, and uh, I just something just jumped right out at me. Tw Twenty-five parking spaces. Did you? Are there any sort of guidelines or anything as to what recommended sp number of spaces would be? Is there? Uh, we, we attempted to come up with 24 to, to 30 spaces for each facility. You can see that the one ball field here for Alternative 1 is 24. We've got the two fields with associated parking, the 30 to 24. And then we, we've basically compressed these at 25. As you can see, there isn't a whole lot of space left over in this scenario. And I think by the time we got to this and realized the cost, we kind of lost a, a little bit of interest in it, to be honest with you. Uh, this this area, though, this parking uh, alongside the road should be recognized as a, a more efficient or cost-effective way to develop parking rather than the, the isolated off-road off parking. Councilor McKenzie. At Lions Field, with the 100-foot uh, setback from the wetland in what you have pictured as alternative one for the baseball diamond. Could a soccer field be put in there instead? There. With a hundred foot? With the, with the hundred foot, I guess I'm sorry, alternative two, I said one, two. Could it could be put where the field, the westerly field is? Yeah, basically for any development, uh, the, f the further downslope you are and the further to the east you are, the better off you are. Uh, you get a little bit of a break with the topography. The, the ledge gets more extreme in this corner and then the upper reaches of the, of the hillside. Um, we've tried, you could, I guess, do the same thing with this soccer lacrosse field. You can see that we're held pretty much by the existing road here. And then because of the, the size of the field and the fact that it's a relatively flat plain, uh, you're going 300, 225 feet and you're only gaining uh, three feet across that. So you're fighting it. You're fighting the terrain all the way up. So you couldn't move that field west. I think I, you could, but I think it would, it would cost more money to do so. Councillor Reid. Uh, yes. Did you take into account uh, any um, greenbelt areas or any areas that, before buffer, buffering in your proposal, is currently used as part of the trail system? Was that part of your study at all? No. Thank you. Councilor Nell. Yes, thank you. Um, when you go from the, uh, if you could give me the Reader's Digest version, uh, uh, are there any assumptions from the hundred, uh, from the 250 foot setback to the, the hundred? I mean, is can you do a hundred foot wetland setback or? Not with the current zoning regulations as they exist today. As long as these are considered RP1 wetlands, which we're pretty, we're very strong that this one is, we're very strong that this one is. This one to the west may be somewhat questioned. As long as those are considered RP1 wetlands and you're using the, 
current zoning regulations, you need a 250-foot setback. Now, are those state or local That'd zoning? Be, I believe a local code. I think the state has softened their wetlands rules somewhat. I'll just remind you that we are doing a zoning ordinance rewrite review. Councilor Groff. If I understand your presentation correctly, what you're telling us is that it's impossible uh, with any degree of cost effectiveness at all to put a soccer field, a combination soccer field, lacrosse field at Lions Field. Is that what you're saying? That's, that's what we believe the, the findings would be. It would be very difficult to do it. So the only thing that's possible from a cost point of view, and in all, probably from an engineering point of view, is to put one or perhaps two Little League fields at Lions Field, but that's the extent that that property could conceivably be developed, in your opinion? Our opinion right now, uh, certainly from an engineering standpoint, we could build it if you gave us enough money, but uh, <laughs> two, two Little League fields looks to be that that's the maximum that that field could support right now. By that field, you mean that parcel of land that into That parcel the of land. Thank the field. you. I will reiterate, however, what Mr. Harding said. It depends on how much money you want to spend to accomplish something. Any other counselors? Mr. Harding, the lacrosse soccer field, does that accommodate field hockey? I would assume so. <laughs> I think that it's fairly the same dimensions. Thank you. We don't have, we don't have any field hockey players in our office. I'm sorry. I'll send my daughter over. Anything else from the council? Councilor McGinty. Uh, I move that we uh, accept the receipt of the report and refer it to a council workshop. Okay. Councilor Reed? I'll second that if you put a date on that council's workshop. We don't have a date yet. Do you want to leave the motion as it stands and we'll have discussion? Yes, I, I think I'll we, second we, can, we can discuss when the date is. Thank you. I would like to start that discussion with a memo that I sent to the Council at the end of last week about this agenda item. But I certainly do want us to set this to a Council workshop. I would like to do this sooner rather than later. What I would like to propose is that we do this at a workshop on Monday, June 24th, which is two weeks from this evening, which was already tentatively scheduled, at least in some people's books, for a workshop evening. What I would like to propose is that we have this be a facilitated workshop for the Council. It will be a public meeting, of course. The public is very welcome to attend. We have been in contact with a local facilitator who does not know, who does, yeah, does not live in Cape Elizabeth, um, and fortunately does not have any stakes one way or the other in the playing field issue, does, from what we are told, has no knowledge of this issue. My recollection of past discussions was that there was a fair, fair amount of agreement that there was a need for additional playing fields in this community. That's certainly a starting place that evening to reaffirm that assumption and then move towards solving the problem of where to locate new playing fields and how to pay for them. We do have a lot of information available to us. I don't know if Councilor Groff has received the mountain of information that's been accumulating over the past year. But we'll make sure that he has that. I would also propose that at such a workshop, for the purpose of an inquiry only, any Councilor would be able to call on any member of the public in attendance and it would not be a televised workshop. I would hope we proceed through that evening to such an extent that we could set the item to a public hearing for the July agenda.
Sounds good to me. If you need to, to, to revise or amend my motion to include all that, I'd be happy to do that if it's necessary. Councilor Jordan. Just for a question from a senior citizen, I'll put it that way. Why do we need a facility? I think I, as the chairman, would very much appreciate not being in charge of running that kind of meeting. I want there to be no accusations or contemplation of any bias on any counselor's part. I think we're a lot better served if we have an outside person who has no interest in the issue. I think it's a healthier process. I would like the council to go along with that kind of process. We've tried a lot of other processes. Some of them work. Some of them haven't worked, and I think we'd be in very good stead to go along with this approach and see if we can come up with a healthy attitude where we all come in with a win-win in the back of our minds and see what we can come up with. And I would much rather that be led by somebody other than myself. Is this a freebie? No, it is not. What's the cost? I can't tell you. It depends on how much time it takes. I've been informed. What's the hourly cost? You know, I don't have an hourly cost, sir. I have a per day cost. I do not expect it to take a full day. <laughs> Mr. McGovern? Yeah, I spoke to uh, one fac the facilitator that uh, the chairman's referencing, and her rate is $600 for, for the equivalent of an eight hour day. So I can count that back for an hour? Yes, you can. Thank you. Councilor Reid? Unless she has a one day minimum. No, she doesn't. She indicated that she was willing to prorate the time, but you know, obviously it's not just the time that, that she would spend at the meeting. There would be you know, a, a meeting with her in advance to make sure she has the information she needs prior to it. Uh, she's also indicated a willingness, and although you know, it's just a willingness, I didn't have any discussion with her beyond that, of uh, possibly assembling a report uh, based on what occurred at the meeting. The report meaning a summary of the conclusions reached, if any. And one, one more little comment. I'd rather put the three to six hundred dollars towards the field and handle the situation ourselves. I think we could find somebody in the town to run the meeting if, if you didn't feel that you could do it voluntarily. We certainly have a number of facilitators who are residents of Cape Elizabeth. Their names are on some of the lists I receive from a variety of people. I want to keep this process as clean as we can, and that's why I decided we would be much better off if to have a facilitated meeting with a facilitator not from this community. It's been too contentious an issue, and that's where I was coming from. Council Linnell? Madam Chair, I mean, I, I, uh, um, would sympathize with Councilor Jordan's concern about spending another three, four, five, six hundred dollars. Uh, however, I think, uh, given the amount of the attention that's been on this subject and the potential uh, <coughs> stomach-wrenching uh, uh, outcomes and so forth, I think it would probably be uh, well spent. Councilor Reid. I would add, besides the money being well spent, um, we also have to take a look at how long this has taken to get us to this process, and if having an independent facilitator would help us move to the next step uh, any sooner, I strongly support the recommendation. Councilor Cogsell. Yes, I hope that it, prior to the meeting, we'll have some sort of an outline of, that will follow the um, discussion that we will have. I would fully expect that. I have spoken with Janet about the use of a facilitator, and I've, I know it has been a very successful process in, in other communities when there has been a very contentious issue, and I agree that we should try to keep this process as clean as possible, and um, I, I support, I think this is an issue that we should use this method for solving. Councilor Jordan? I just want to say I understand your people's comments and what have you, and I just can't understand why you're so concerned 
that it wouldn't be a clean setup if the council handled it themselves. And we have to call somebody in for three, four hundred dollars just to keep it clean. I just can't understand that. I don't feel that I'm going to get it carried away so you'd be so upset and feel that uh, I'm throwing out dirty things. And I thought we was beyond that. And uh, this sounds like the, the election that's about to be taken care of tomorrow. I certainly hope we don't stoop to those levels. Perhaps I could have used a better word, and I apologize for the use of that word if it's raising people's hackles. At this point, I would like to very much thank Mr. Harding for his presentation this evening for, for the work of OST Associates. Thank you for being with us. Just Steve, has a, Mr. Harding, has agreed to leave those up here, and they'll be up for the next week or two if anyone wants to come in and take a closer look at them. Thank you very much. One other suggestion I've had that I think bears merit is to see if we can get some stakes in place on site so the public will be able to visit both Lyons Field and the Fort Williams area under consideration to know exactly what is being, where things are being considered. I've heard confusion in the past, and I think it would help if we have something physically in and on the ground to help people with their understanding. Perhaps Mr. Harding can help us with that. Thank you. Council Coxell. Which other proposals for Fort Williams are you going to have staked? Because you've got the two different orientations. Um, did we just have the one that was the original proposal there as a comparison and that is no longer in consideration? And we're just going with a turned soccer field? That would the later proposal. That would be my understanding of what we are looking okay, at. I think it was important to clarify. Mm -hmm. And so it would, be, it would be alternative two, three, four, and five. I think one of those was a bit too expensive for most people's blood. Is that the last one? Alternative three. Alternative three. three. Have a lot of. So it would be two, four, and five. I don't. Have Something like two, open. four, and five. Most okay. likely. Mm -hmm. I think we can make, we'll see what we can make available to the public and those alternatives here at Town Hall and at the library. We do, mm -hmm. is there, before the council has its vote this evening, is there anybody from the public who would like to comment on this? All right, seeing none. We do have a motion. Council McGinty. I just want to ensure that my motion does include setting this for a public hearing in, at the July Town Council meeting. Huh? That's right. We need the date. Do you yeah. want to amend your motion, start over? Well, How do you well, want to deal with it? Yeah. Okay. I think it's cleaner if you make a new motion, Mr. Council McGinty. Okay, what's your on my motion, my original motion? Thank you. Second withdraw. Was Ellis, right? Yes. Thank you. Okay, I move that the council accept the report on the ball fields uh, and set it for a workshop on June 24th, and also set a public hearing at the next at the July town council meeting on July 8th, 1996. at 7.30 p.m. I'll second. Thank you. Any further discussion? Do we, oh, excuse me. Do we, uh, do we need a uh, consensus on the facilitator part? Is that in there, too? Do we need to have that? I will take that as assumed at this point. Fine. Are you more comfortable amending the motion? Well, it doesn't matter to me. I just wanted to, just as long as we're clear. Uh, if we're, perhaps we should. Would you like to offer an amendment? I'll amend my motion <laughs> to include that a facilitator be used at the meeting. At the, at the workshop. workshop. At the workshop, I'm sorry. And I'll second. Okay. Second. Thank you. Any further discussion? Yes. Do we need to vote on the amendment? I think it's clear. Jordan. 
the fist motion was pretty good because it was already vote and fail of it. But you know, and now you added a little click on the end. It sounds like I'm going to have to vote against. Thank you. All those in favor? All those opposed? Six to one. Councilor Jordan. Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. Item number 22 is potential action on town council goals. And I would like to just share a few thoughts with the council before we get in further into that one, since I forgot to give you my little speech earlier this evening. <laughs> and this may not, this, as I was writing out a few thoughts for this evening, I realized that some of them overlapped, perhaps with goals. It's basically the tenor for the year that I would like to set. I think we've had an example of that. We got right to work this evening. We have a consent calendar, and I'm asking and appreciate the council support in bringing in a facilitator in a couple of weeks. I hope as we progress through the year, we will continue to keep a good balanced perspective, that we will focus our efforts on policy, decisions, leaving the implementation to the manager and to the staff. I hope very much that we can work together with a good collaborative and problem-solving approach to those policy decisions, that we do so in forums that have effective communication, both for the council within itself, the council and the citizens, with the school board and with other entities with whom we do have communications. And I certainly hope that our efforts in this council year are going to foster a sense of community and remind people what a good, caring community we have here and focus on the positive. It's been my experience that when you start looking for something, you tend to find it and you put your efforts in that particular direction. And I ask the rest of the council to join me along those lines for this council year, and I appreciate that support from you. I did ask the councillors to be thinking about goals for the council year. I appreciate the submissions that we received. I would suggest that we have a discussion of those goals in a workshop, either probably pushing it if we try to do it, at the end of this evening. If there's enough time, however, I would like to do it then. We do have a very full month ahead of us if we have a Zork review on Monday the 17th, and we have a workshop scheduled for the 24th. We might consider doing a, a half hour discussion about goals at a workshop on the 24th, and that's something we can decide later this evening when we see how the rest of our agenda progresses. At this point, I would entertain a motion to set the discussion on council goals to a workshop. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Hmm. Council McGinty? Only that I think that we should allot ourselves more than a half hour for this. I think it's important enough to take enough time. Okay. I, I wouldn't feel comfortable being pressed to make mm -hmm. snap decisions on this. Thank you. Appreciate the reminder. Anybody else? I agree. I could talk for the whole half hour. I agree she could. That's <laughs> 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 oh, <sorry. I> <laughs> <Poor Dave. laughs> I'm sure we'll see that that's taken care of. All those in favor of the motion? Opposed? Thank you. 7 0. So Item number 23 is a request to carry forward certain balances. Mr. McGovern? Yes, thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, Council has a list before it of various projects and other odds and ends of uh, requests that the funds be carried forward beyond the end of the June 30 fiscal year. I think that there's one worth highlighting on this list, and that is the third one on the Council's list, which is roadway improvements, 111,054. I'm also recommending that you authorize that, that if we reach our target undesignated surplus, which this year will be 1,250,000, that anything above that that would have gone into surplus instead go into the roadway improvement fund. Uh, what we're finding is we're really beginning to fall behind. Many of the, the roads uh, 
were all done about the same time back with the earlier sewer projects and they all seem to be getting into tough shape at once so this would be a, a real infusion of cash into the roadway improvement account would help us with some of our matching uh, requirements of some of the grants but even particularly would uh, help with, with our roads that are that are rapidly beginning to deteriorate. We've had three tough winters in a row with freezes and thaws and uh, the extra cash would help. Thank you. Can I have a motion, please? Elsa Reid. Uh, Madam Chairman, I move that we accept uh, and approve the proposed carry forward balances for FY96 as presented. Second. Thank you. Any discussion or questions? Elsa Reid. I have a small question. Michael, uh, for the uh, library copier, uh, it just begs the question what happens to the money that's collected for the copies? Are they used for consumables or for gap? Yeah. The, the library copier fund also includes the copier up in the assessor's office. And what it is is a, a rotating fund that all the supplies are paid out of. But even more, partic more particular, that fund tends to grow quite a bit. And that will be used in the future uh, to either purchase a, a copier or copiers or to begin lease purchases of, uh, of copiers. Thank you. Anybody else? All those in favor? Opposed? Thank you. 7 0. Item number 24, the request to transfer funds to accounts needing additional funds. Before I ask the manager for some information, I'll say how pleased I am to see that there are only four accounts on the list this year. That's remarkable and appreciated. Ms. McGovern? I'll, I'll start at the bottom. The dispatcher won $3,000. Uh, as many of you know, we had a dispatcher leave unexpectedly a few months ago, which created some overtime costs. Plus, we also had a, a suspension of a dispatcher earlier in the year, uh, which also resulted in some overtime costs. So that, that's the reason why that particular account is over. Legal and audit, uh, $7,000. I think that is the, the least that's been asked for in any time in the last 10 years. Uh, we've been a lot closer on, on our legal costs and pleased that uh, we, we stayed out of trouble this past year, at least from the, the legal point of view. Town Council, the, the amount is scary when you look at it, and I, I really apologize to the Town Council for including it under the title of Town Council. But you, you've authorized a number of projects during the uh, public safety facility study, the ball field study, and while amounts were set aside, they weren't specifically authorized at a council meeting. And this, this merely uh, memorializes those activities. And uh, it, it makes absolutely clear that uh, that those funds are coming out of that account. It, it, mainly what it does, it creates a much easier audit trail for the auditors. Uh, so, you know, this, if monies were previously set aside for the ball field study, as uh, now Councillor Cogswell is uh, implying to me, uh, th this merely puts in the same place. The amount's 30000 but I don't want anyone to think that the town council overspent their budget by 30000 This was really things that you, you did see during the year and that you uh, planned for. And I, I could have set it up with a different title and a different account and I put it under town council and hope you, you don't you aren't too offended. Uh, the final one is town hall, uh, $5,000. Uh, that is, I, I don't know why, but I just blew the water budget totally. Uh, <laughs> I, I have no explanation and it's underfunded in next year's budget as well. Uh, building repair, I think if anyone looks around this building, we really tried to do a lot of extra painting. Uh, a lot of odds and ends to, to get the place in much better shape. I don't think it's ever looked better. And uh, the heat also was over budget as a result of uh, some heating repairs as, uh, in a colder winter than we've had in a few years. So that's 5000 But overall, uh, budgeted levels are doing very well. Our excise tax income last month was $17,000 higher than any month in history. Uh, from went up to from about 100, 105,000, you know, went, went up to 127,000 in one month. So apparently, folks are buying new cars and, uh, or leasing new cars. So overall, revenues are coming in good. We're, we're finishing an excellent year. Uh, I think we'll more than exceed our, our designated uh, surplus level. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions, Councilor McGinty? I'll move the revised appropriations request. I'll second. Thank you. Questions, discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? 7 0. Thank you. Item number 25. 
Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. Is a request to disperse investment earnings from the 1994 bond to the school department. This was discussed by the council at its workshop on May 20th. Mr. McGovern? Yes, the investment earnings for the school project uh, need to be predominantly spent by the end of August, uh, the beginning of August, excuse me. Uh, otherwise, the uh, federal government takes the interest earnings back uh, to their own good purposes. Uh, therefore, we've tried to go along the last couple of years of reinvesting these earnings in infrastructure within the community, particularly in, in those types of areas that, you know, led to why we had to have the big school bond. Uh, this particular proposal is, is the, the unallocated investment amount that's projected to be left is $12,894, and it's proposed to give it to the school department where it would eventually help in replacing the bleachers in the middle school gym. It's, it's really up to the school board, but it would be a strong suggestion, obviously, that's where it goes. However, because of the IRS rule, and it won't be done by August 1, we're simply giving it to them under this proposal, suggesting that they buy something that was otherwise already in their budget with it, and then take those funds that were already in the budget for that purpose and put them aside in a special fund for the bleachers. Same explanation we had at the workshop. Thank you. Councillor Reid. I have a question. Uh, when we vote to approve this, instead of, or, or let me ask it this way, is there any likelihood that that number will be any different than $12,894 plus or minus? There's every likelihood. So when we vote to approve this, should not we just reference the unallocated funds, period, regardless of a specific dollar amount? understanding that it could be $13,952 or whatever. If that's the, the desire of the council, that'd be fine. I just think it's a more appropriate way to ask. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's very sensible. Mm -hmm. Councilor Groff? Why can't we just say that an additional surplus, which is anticipated, is expected to be approximately, and then give a number? Because I think the public 